Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to share this topic with you today, the bone and metabolic complications among youth living with HIV. As we are now in the advance of the combination and territorial therapy era, our HIV infected children are growing up and surviving in a longer period of time. So most of them right now enter adolescence or even young adulthood period. And with these changes, uh, we observe the increase in the incidence of the long-term non-infectious complications that we call the NCD or non-communicable diseases. For example, neurocognitive disorders, cardiovascular complications, liver dysfunction, adverse bone health, chronic lung diseases, metabolic syndrome, kidney dysfunction, as well as delayed growth and puberty. And the major contributing cause of these complications include the advancing of age of adolescents, chronic HIV infection itself, long-term use of some specific type of ART, as well as the toxicity of concomitant drug that they used. And for today, I will focus on these two uh, complications among these uh, HIV-infected youth, which is the adverse bone health as well as the metabolic syndrome. For the first topic, met, uh, bone, met, uh, bone complications among youth living with HIV. Among HIV-infected youth, their bone health seems to be compromised when compared to their age and sex match HIV-uninfected peers. Because during the first two decades of life, it is the period that have the maximum bone mineral accrual uh, for these adolescents. And if they have the reduced bone deposition and increase in the bone resorption during this critical period, it can lead to the serious consequences, for example, osteoporosis or bone fragility later in life. And the major contributing factors for the bone complications among HIV infected youth include the chronic HIV infection, as well as the exposure to some specific type of ART. And uh, this risk seems to be accumulated over the decades. This figure shows you the timing of the effect of the antiretroviral treatment on the bone mass and bone uh, metabolism. And you can see that for normal population, during the period of adolescence is the period that uh, adolescents have the maximum bone mineral accrual to reach adult peak bone mass. HIV itself can have some impact on the bone mineral accrual in any stage of development, but not for ART. ART mainly uh, impact on the bone mineral density or bone mineral accrual during the adolescence period, and that can compromise adult peak bone mass among these adolescents. Here's the figure show you the hypothetical evolution of the bone acquisition with HIV infection early in life. You can see in the black thin line for HIV uninfected individuals, the bone mineral accrual usually occur during first two decades of life and reach adult peak bone mass during the third decade of life and then gradually decline over time. But for those acquired HIV infection since birth that we call perinatally acquired HIV infection, uh, you can see in the black thick line that the bone mineral accrual seems to be compromised since then, and therefore their adult peak bone mass will be compromised when compared to HIV infected in the uninfected individuals and then rapidly decline over time. For those acquired HIV infection during adolescence, for example, behaviorally acquired HIV infection, prior to uh, HIV infection, their bone mineral acquisition seems to be normal, but after HIV infection, it can compromise their bone mineral accruals, and that also results in the reduced adult peak bone mass and then rapidly decline over time. And this figure shows you the result of my, one of my study to compare the bone mineral density among HIV infected youth to their HIV uninfected peer who have the same age and sex. And you can see in the black line, it is the bone mineral density for HIV infected individuals, and the dot line is the bone mineral density for HIV uninfected individuals. And you can see very rapidly that uh, the bone mineral density among HIV infected youth seems to be uh, lower when compared to their age and sex match HIV uninfected peer. Before we go further, we have to make it clear that the definition of the low bone mineral density among adults and children are different. Because adults already have rich adult peak bone mass, therefore their bone mineral density assessment using T-scores. And the T-score less than minus 2.5 determine osteoporosis, and between minus 1 to minus 2.5 determine osteopenia. But for children and adolescents, because this population have not yet reached adult peak bone mass, therefore their bone mineral density need to be compared with their healthy age and sex match individuals and represent as a C scores. And if the C score equals or below minus two, it's determined the low bone mineral density or adverse bone health among this population. 
This slide shows you the prevalence of the low bone marrow density among youth living with HIV. And you can see by eyeball that the prevalence of low bone marrow density among resort-rich countries, for example, Italy, US, and Netherlands, seems to be lower when compared to the prevalence of resort-limited settings like Thailand and Brazil. And the cause of the variation in the prevalence may be due to the HIV clinical staging at the time of ART initiation, which is so different uh, across the study and across the countries, as well as the duration of ART. Also, the differences in the lifestyle, nutritional status, food intake, dietary supplement also be the factors, as well as the method of assessment and the definition of low bone marrow density used in the study. This shows you the immunopathogenesis of the low bone marrow density among HIV-infected youth. For HIV-infected individuals, they also have the traditional risk factor, which is quite similar to HIV-uninfected individuals. But because they are HIV-infected individuals, they also have HIV infection factors as well as the ART to uh, impact on the low bone marrow density. For HIV infection, it can cause the chronic immune activation. And with this immune uh, activation, it can cause the increases in the inflammatory cytokines and osteoclastogenic cytokines that may result in finally imbalance between bone turnover. The bone resorption may overcome the bone formation and finally result in low bone mineral density among this population. If this adolescent have poor immunological function as well as uncontrolled viremia, these two factors can impact directly on the low bone marrow density. For ART, the benefit of ART is immune reconstitution, but it comes along with the increase in the inflammatory cytokines in the body, and that can result in the imbalance of the bone turnover and finally result in low bone marrow density as well. So when we talk about the causes of low bone marrow density among HIV-infected youth, it is multifactorial, and we can classify into two categories, traditional risk factors as well as the HIV-specific factors. For traditional factors, for example, the short stature, malnutrition, vitamin D deficiency, inadequate calcium intake, inactivity of the physical inactivity, as well as smoking and steroid use may be compromised the bone. For HIV factors, as I just said, uh, present in the previous slide, HIV itself, advance of the disease, exposed to some specific types of ART, and persistent immune activation and chronic systemic inflammation can contribute to the low bone mineral density among this population. This is uh, the study that I and my study team, a lot of investigators and site PI sitting in the front row, uh, helped us together to uh, conduct a study to determine the prevalence of the low bone marrow density among our HIV infected adolescents. And we used DEXA bone scan, the lumbar spine at the level of L2 to L4 to determine the prevalence of low bone marrow density. And here you can see that the factor that can contribute to low bone marrow density among our population include the increasing of age, the wasting syndrome or the BMI less than 5 percentile, ever exposed to PI-based regimen, as well as the very poor immunological status prior to ART initiation. In terms of vitamin D deficiency, what is the impact on the low bone marrow density among HIV-infected youth? So we also conduct another study to determine this and even our adolescent living in tropical countries where we have sunlight year round, the prevalence of hypovitaminosis D or vitamin D deficiency is still there, 21%. And because if we have vitamin D deficiency, our calcium level will decline and our body will have the negative feedback to cause the secondary hyperparathyroidism. And the prevalence of secondary hyperparathyroidism among our adolescent was about 17%. And about 5% of our adolescents have both condition, vitamin D deficiency, together with secondary hyperparathyroidism. And in this study, maybe missed uh, table, but I will explain you. Uh, if our adolescents have both vitamin D deficiency together with secondary hyperparathyroidism, they seem to have higher bone turnover markers, increased in uh, alkali phosphatase, CTX, which is the bone resorption markers, and P1 and P, which is the bone formation markers, when compared to the rest of the cohort. As 
well as we saw that adolescents who have both vitamin D deficiency together with secondary hyperparathyroidism have decrease of the bone marrow density C scores when compared to the rest of the cohort. And this is show the significant difference. This shows you the same thing, but in the figure. You can see that CTX bone resorption markers, P1 and P bone formation markers seem to be greater, the greatest among adolescents who have the vitamin D deficiency together with secondary hyperparathyroidism. And the prevalence or the proportion of the low bone marrow density was significantly higher among those who have both conditions. In terms of tenophobia, that we all know that uh, TDF or tenophobia disoproxy fumarate is a bone unfriendly regimen. We also have conducted another study to determine the impact of TDF on the bone mass among our adolescents. And you can see from this table that among adolescents who use the TDF, that we call TDF user, they seem to have significantly lower of the calcium level as well as the bone formation markers, and significantly increase in the IPTH, which means the palatal hormone level and the bone re resorption markers. But in our study, we cannot demonstrate the significant change of the bone marrow density C score between the TDF user and TDF un, uh, non users. But because we follow up uh, our adolescent just four years after TDF initiation, it may be too short to determine the long term effect like bone complication among this population. And we think that if we follow up for a longer period of time, we may determine the impact of the TDF on the bone marrow density among our adolescents. And what's the impact of the low bone marrow density among HIV infected adolescents? First of all, it can cause the low adult peak bone mass at the end of the puberty. And with this, it can cause a lifelong adverse bone effect. For example, osteopenia, osteoporosis, or even fracture. But this complication did not usually not occur during the early life. It usually manifests during the after fifth or fourth decades of life. So we have to wait and see for these kinds of complications. For about the management of low bone marrow density, we have both general management as well as the pharmacologic intervention. For the general management, we should encourage our adolescent to have a healthy lifestyle. For example, avoid smoking and heavy alcohol consumption. And we as a healthcare provider should avoid the bone unfriendly ART if we have the alternative regimen. We should recommend them to have the regular exercise, for example, weight-bearing exercises and muscle strengthening exercise. We should encourage them to improve their nutritional status by uh, adequate intake of the calcium and vitamin D. And the number in parentheses uh, indicate the recommended uh, calcium and vitamin D intake daily for adolescents. 1,300 milligrams per day for calcium and 600 international units per day for vitamin D. And if they cannot have adequate calcium and vitamin D intake, we may supplement them with calcium and vitamin D. For the TDF, because right now TDF is the first line ART and RTI to use in the Thai guidelines, but if in the near future, we have the alternative regimen such as TAF or tenophobia alafenamide. We should switch to use a TAF to protect the bone for HIV infected adolescent, especially if they demonstrate the signal of the low bone marrow density. And what is TAF? TAF is a nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors and a product of tenophobia that which now approved for use for children and adolescents aged above six years and weight above 35 kilograms. And TAF has so several fixed dose combination regimen that you can choose for your adolescents. And here's the summary of the FDA approved TAF containing regimen. For TAF monotherapy, it's not approved for use for uh, HIV treatment. It approved for use just only hepatitis B treatment. For HIV, you can pick one of these. Uh, which is the fixed dose combination regimen that you can hear. You already heard from uh, Dr. Gunganya's slide. And why TAF is so uh, safe for bone? Because the characteristic of TAF is so different from TDF. TAF is very stable in the plasma. It usually metabolizes in the target cell. And with uh, the lower plasma concentration and higher intracellular concentration, we can reduce dose of TAF when compared to TDF. For example, you use TDF 300 milligrams per day, you use TAF just only 25 milligrams per day, or just 10 if you use with cobicistat. And this very low dose of TAF, you can uh, save 
for kidney and bone for your adolescents. And this is one of the study to uh, demonstrate the evidence show uh, the safety and efficacy of TAF among HIV infected youth conducted in many centers around the world, including Thailand uh, at HIVNET and as well as the Kongan University, uh, using the Genvoya among treatment naive HIV infected adolescent age between 12 to 18 years for 48 weeks. And you can see from this picture that the bone density, both spine and low, uh, total body less head for this adolescent increased over time. But this is not surprise us at all because this is the first two decades of life which uh, the bone accurate usually increased. But when you see, uh, look at the C-score, the BMD C-score is quite stable over time, which is good. That means uh, the TAF is very safe for bone because if you look at the data from TDF, the bone density usually decline over time. In terms of vitamin D and calcium supplementation, I and a lot of PI here uh, help us to con uh, conduct a randomized clinical trial to determine whether vitamin D and calcium supplement improve the bone marrow density among our population. And this is a randomized clinical trial that we uh, randomize our children to receive either high dose of vitamin D, 3,200 3, international unit per day plus calcium supplementation or normal dose of vitamin D supplement, 400 international unit per day plus calcium supplementation. And the result of our study show that if adolescents have already had their low bone marrow density at baseline, supplement calcium and vitamin D, regardless of dosage, can improve the bone marrow density among this population. But in our study, we did not show the significant difference of the change of the bone marrow density comparing those received high dose vitamin D compared with normal dose vitamin D. Therefore, if your adolescent have already had the low bone marrow density, you can supplement the calcium and vitamin D regardless of dose that can improve significantly the bone marrow density among this population. For the pharmacologic intervention, there are several agents that can be used to treat low bone marrow density among HIV infected populations. Uh, the first drug that we are quite familiar with is the bisphosphonate. And another drug, including of the serum estrogen receptor modulator, serums, monoclonal antibodies to Lang L, and among others. For alendronate, which is the drug that we are quite familiar with to treat uh, low bone marrow density among HIV uninfected population. This uh, study just published last year uh, to determine the effect of the alendronate on the bone marrow density among HIV infected youth aged between 11 to 24 years who already had the low bone marrow density or BMDC score lower than minus 1.5 or have the history of osteoporotic fractures. And you can see from this uh, result of the study that among those who randomly to receive the alendronate, the bone marrow density improved over time when compared to placebo. And in this study, there is no safety concern of alendronate among HIV infected adolescents. So for adolescents who already have fracture or very severe low bone marrow density, alendronate may be an alternative regimen to treat this kind of adolescents. And this is the first topic, the bone complications among HIV infected youth, then let's switch to another topic, metabolic complications among youth living with HIV. With the long-term benefits of ART, we all know that it's come along with the complication. One of that is the, uh, metabolic complication, include the metabolic syndrome, lipodystrophy, lactic acidosis, dyslipidemia, as well as the glucose intolerance or type 2 DM. This study compared the metabolic uh, complications among HIV, perinatally HIV infected adolescent and young adult to general population. And you can see that when compared HIV infected men to general men in the same countries, you can see that among HIV infected men, they have significantly increased in the triglyceride level and reduced in the HDL cholesterol when compared to general population. Similarly, for female, HIV infected women seems to have increased significantly the waist circumference, reduce of the HDL cholesterol, and increase in the incidence of metabolic syndrome when compared to general population. For the risk factor, the major risk factor for metabolic complications among this population is ART. You may know that lipodystrophy, 
syndrome associated with the old fashion in RTI, for example, D40, ACT, or DDI, that right now we should avoid to use these drugs. And also associated with some type of PI, such as lopinavir, ritonavir. This lipidemia also increased uh, with using the old generation of NRTIs and PIs. Insulin resistant and type 2 DM similarly associated with NRTIs, the old generation as well as the PI. And currently, we just know that the new class of ART, for example, in RTIs such as TAF, and integrase inhibitors can increase the weight and fat gain. And we have to wait and see for more data that whether or not this weight gain and fat gain is associated with the metabolic complication or not. This study conducted uh, by Cirilla team, uh, led, led by Dr. Kun Ganya, to evaluate the metabolic complications among perinatally HIV-infected Thai adolescents. And you can see from this study that the prevalence of, of metabolic syndrome was about 10%. Pre-diabetes, 22%, type 2 DM, 4%, and this lipidemia is very, very high, 70%. And the uh, associated factor of the pre-diabetes or type 2 DM include obesity, presence of lipohypertrophy, and exposed to the D4 T4 at least six months. And the associated factors of the metabolic syndrome include the presence of lipohypertrophy and long, uh, long duration use of PI. And this is the result of the study that was presented as an oral presentation at CROI last year uh, to demonstrate the in association between the integrase inhibitor and the weight gain. And when you look at the data, the result of the study, this study conducted among treatment naive adults living with HIV and start with integrase inhibitors. And you can see that the weight gain seems to be significantly higher among those using uh, integrase inhibitor when compared to PI and NNRTI. And among integrase inhibitor, doritecovir seems to have the most impact on the weight gain. So right now, the mechanism and long-term consequences of the weight gain and fat gain among this population still remain unclear. We have to wait for more data and evidence to determine the effect and the mechanism. For the management of the metabolic complications, first of all, we should avoid, if we have the alternative regimen, the ART that can cause the metabolic toxicities. And if our adolescent already have the metabolic complications, we should treat them following the standard guidelines for general population. For example, you should advise them to have the regular exercise, change the lifestyle and dietary intake, as well as if they have intractable problems, you may prescribe the drug for treatment. For example, statins for dyslipidemia and biguanides for type 2 DM. Also, you have to monitor the consequences of these metabolic complications. For example, the subclinical atherosclerosis or early cardiovascular disease among adolescents to prevent and reduce the mortality and morbidity among this population. So in conclusion, right now we are in the advanced combination and deratoral therapy era. The non-infectious complications among this population is increasing, including the bone and metabolic complications. Both traditional and HIV-related factors can contribute to these complications. And we are, as we are a healthcare provider, we should continuously monitor this complication and also their long-term consequences in order to reduce the morbidity and mortality among this population and help them have the longer survival period with good quality of life. So thank you for your attention. May, may I have one question? Um, we, we discussed that the, the bone and metabolic complication is, is very important for growing adolescent. However, the practicality of giving um, recommendation as a exercise regularly, take calcium, vitamin D every day, it's quite impossible for adolescent. And um, there are some approach like in, in UK, sometimes they just do giving the vitamin D and calcium as a loading dose at a monthly or a quarterly in order to make sure that vitamin D is adequate. Because according to your data, if they have baseline vitamin D deficiency, it's more likely that they will have bone problems. So what is your advice about giving as a pulse of vitamin D monthly or quarterly? 
For example, you can dot patients when they come for a quarterly pickup of uh, ART. Do you have any information on that? Yeah. Or Sankun Ganya may have some suggestion about how she deal with that in her clinics. Well, thank you. For vitamin D deficiency, we found that almost all of them will be either vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency. And uh, not just the patients, including me and you, you know. Uh, there's a study done in uh, one of the medical schools in Thailand and found that 100% of the nurses and about 70 or 80% in another study of the doctors, you know, also vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency. And you'd be surprised that uh, we are, you know, in the morning we put on a sunblock and, you know, we avoid, uh, you know, the sun between 10 to 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So you never get vitamin D from, from, <laughs> yes, from the sun. So, so, so in short, uh, everybody uh, have vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency. And I, I do agree with you that uh, every one of us actually should get vitamin D supplementation. Uh, the matter is that uh, we don't really have the um, standard recommendation of how much to give and uh, uh, whether, you know, the, the correlation between vitamin D insufficiency uh, for HIV, you, you have elaborated, uh, but the data um, of the, uh, the, is not that strong of how, what is the, you know, the, the, the poor outcome that would be for vitamin D insufficiency. We know that we shouldn't have uh, insufficiency level because you, you, you could have other things else in the future. But, uh, you know, uh, we, we give them every day. They don't want to take it. You may want to choose like every month one one uh, cap, uh, 20,000 uh, 20, unit, one cap every month or like myself, I take every other, uh, every other week, you know, myself. Uh, still, when I shake my blood, it's still insufficiency, you know. Uh, so, so every one of us, you know, particularly who are, you know, getting age, we should get one, uh, <laughs> one, one capsule. Yeah, everyone, everyone, you know, particularly in older age. But for patients, it's even more important. And, and, and I do agree with you that uh, perhaps we need, we, we need to, to do some study to show that perhaps uh, one capsule per month or uh, even two capsules per month, uh, uh, you know, would be better. So Tanya was talking about perhaps three capsules uh, per three months. So every time you come, they come to the clinic visit, you give them three capsules. People don't, un don't, don't know uh, the toxicity. I mean, not, not don't know. There has never been described of uh, toxic dose of vitamin D. What is the level that's too high? Nobody knows. So perhaps uh, three capsules, 60,000 would be, would be okay. But when I talk to the endocrinologist, they all joke out, oh no, it's too high. You don't know. Perhaps uh, there is like um, uh, some individual report that uh, said that if you take too much vitamin D, you could have uh, nephrocalcinosis. So we, we don't know. You know, they all just no standard uh, study, yeah. So, so I think I think this this is a good uh, research uh, question where Tridesia might be interested. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps uh, you know two or three capsules every time they come to the clinic. So I think I think uh, this this is uh, gonna be something in the you know in the, the niche of the research question. Thank you. But, you know, I, I think if you want to do in your practice, perhaps uh, one capsule per month, I think it's okay, perfectly okay. One capsule of 20,000 units. And this is very cheap. It's only a few baht per cap, yeah. per, per, per week one. Yeah, for me, I, I do agree with this uh, strategy because every day we also have some diet that contain vitamin D and calcium. That may be because we, when we treat the vitamin D deficiency, first of all, we have to restore the vitamin D in our body, that's, that's why the bolus dose work. And then we have uh, regularly intake every day that can uh, supplement uh, gradually. Thank you.